Hi, everybody, and welcome to Own Your Throne podcast. My name is Perry Jones Grossman, and along with me is my sidekick, partner in crime, Diane Chandler. And we have a very exciting show ahead for you guys. We've got an amazing woman. Her name is Rita Wilson. She's a singer, songwriter. She's also a producer, actress, and what I call a renaissance woman. And she certainly knows how to own her throne. So we welcome today Rita Wilson. Hi, Rita. Hi, Perry. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm so happy Hi, to be here. <laughs> Hi, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking so much on the day, you know, getting our makeup done yes. and, and having all this stuff, but I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy that you're doing this show. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important for women to hear what other women have gone through and where they're going because yeah. so many times in our culture, especially, um, age and and wisdom yeah. is not valued as it is in other cultures. And right. mm -hmm. I, I said earlier, like if you're going to give up the hormones, you better get something. For it. And it like, <laughs> thank God for a little bit of wisdom and something that's in your you know so body that can help you out. That is yes. so true. Well, you're talking about wisdom. I know with your childhood that you had a pretty amazing childhood, and your parents and your mama, who I met a couple yes. of times, and she's. Beautiful, beautiful, amazing soul. woman. Mm. I know. She's with us today. Yes, Still she is. is. In here, but you were raised with some family values and also some rituals and practices that was really a foundation for you. So, what would you say was the biggest um, family value or life lesson that they taught you? Well, okay, let me give you a little context because I'm a first generation American. So, my mm -hmm. mother was Greek, and my father was Bulgarian and they met in New York after escaping uh, the war and uh, came to Los Angeles where I was born and raised in Hollywood, California. And even though I was raised in this city that had, you know, it was kind of iconic and people came from all over the world to, you know, find their fame and fortune, yeah. it was still a small town to me because I, I think it was my parents instilled in us family values. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does that mean? My dad worked super hard. He was a bartender, mm -hmm. but he never had a, a day of debt in his life. Wow. He was able to own a house and buy it and sign wow. off on that mortgage. My mom uh, made our clothes, our food. Oh. She took good care of us. She was our best friend. So cool. And uh, my parents, even though they weren't educated, were highly intelligent people. Mm -hmm. And I think growing up in um, a cultural um, difference with, you know, parents who had accents and came from different countries and growing up in, mm -hmm. as an American, I was able to understand that everybody was different. And I think that enabled me and all my brother and sister to have a lot of empathy for people who were not like everyone else. Because I remember mm -hmm. people making fun of my parents' accents and mm -hmm. you know asking them a million times how to spell their last name <laughs> uh, because it wasn't Wilson. And yeah. um, my parents were always about being kind to other people mm -hmm. and about being honest. Mm -hmm. And I really learned that from them. And those values have served me very, very well in my life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that everybody else is living by those same values. Right. Right. But I am not going to change who I am if, if the world is operating in a different way. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that leads me to the question that I was telling Perry that I was so excited that we were going to be interviewing you because my experience of you from afar has always been somebody that's so so confident really mm -hmm. comfortable in your skin really um, warm authentic and so was that something yeah was that something that you've had even since you were young like it sounds like from your family values and really just owning yourself I think I have to credit my parents for that in some mm -hmm. ways because even though they came from uh, the old world they never stopped me from doing anything that I wanted to do. So I didn't have anybody sort of beating me down and mm -hmm. saying, you can't do this or that's a bad idea because I started modeling at 14, acting at 16, mm -hmm. and my parents embraced that. And they so were like, cool. this is a wonderful opportunity. I'm sure that they were very upset when I decided to drop out of college. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> even I as yes. a parent were like, just yes. please finish Finish. Yes. and you can do anything you <laughs> yes. want to do. Yes. But um, I, I think that, that their support mm -hmm. was everything because mm -hmm. I never got a message that, you can't do it or it's a bad thing to do. Oh. And in some ways, I'm when I look back on my childhood, 
I'm surprised that uh, bad things didn't happen to me, you mm -hmm. know, horrible things, yeah. I should say. Um, uh, tricky things happened, mm -hmm. and people are not always what they uh, appear to be, but I was able to have good experiences and yeah. um, work really hard, and I think I learned that from both my parents. Mm -hmm. Great just a work good ethic. work ethic. Yeah. Well, you know, that was something we were talking about earlier, about how you and Tom are known so much in this business as being kind. And those values that you were raised with, I think both of you guys has made, look how long your, your career has been and look how beloved that you guys are. Oh, and I think nice. it goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, but it's true. Yeah, it's, but it's true. And it I, I mean, I've known you 30 years and, you know, you haven't changed, Rita. Neither I mean, are you. I, well, <laughs> neither are you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think we all grow. Yeah. But right. uh, character doesn't change. Right. You know, right. Uh, I think. People grow, people change um, for the better, for the worse, yeah. whatever. But that character is there from the beginning. Right. And uh, I, I believe that people can become better people. Yes. Um, but ultimately, I think who you are is something mm. that you you have, and yeah. you you're you and it's your it's your operating instructions in a yes. way, your character. It's your manual, and yeah. you are either going to do things in an honest, upfront way, or mm -hmm. you're going to do things yeah. in a devious manner, let's <laughs> say, or somewhere in between yes. on that yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think that having that sort of support from my parents when I was growing up uh, didn't instill a lot of doubt in me. Yeah, mm -hmm. did you have, did you ever have from the outside, like living in Hollywood and being an actress and now being a singer songwriter, did you hear that from other people though? What kept you still feeling confident? Did you ever have doubt, like self doubt? Yes, you always yeah. have doubt about everything that you do. Mm -hmm. But I always had a belief that I was going to be okay mm -hmm. no matter how anything turned out. And right. so, um, yes, I grew up in Hollywood, California. And yet, it was still like a small town. We would go to movies oh, cool. and get ice cream and yeah. get our bras and our school clothes. Yeah. But all of that happened on Hollywood Boulevard, you that's know? So funny. It just yeah, sounds so like funny. a strange thing, but yeah. That, yeah. that's what it was like. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was very lucky with the people that were helping me out in my career early on. The photographers who took pictures mm. of me, the agency, Nina Blanchard, who was like the Eileen oh, Ford remember, yes. the West oh, yeah, Coast, yes, um, yes. and uh, my early theatrical agents. So that is, I, I always wanted a mentor. I always wanted somebody to say, grasshopper. You know, <laughs> this is how it is done. My <laughs> and you have to be really old to know what <laughs> that reference is from. From Kung Fu. Um, the TV series, so but um, <laughs> I always wanted that uh, yeah. thing, and I, I had it in a way through my mom, just by her example, and through my my dad. But it wasn't until I met Nora Ephron, the mm -hmm. writer director, that I felt, oh, this is what it feels like to have a mentor, because mm -hmm. it was somebody who absolutely believes in you, and says things like. When I turned 50, she toasted me on my 50th birthday and she said, I am here to tell you that great things happen when you're 50. Oh, I didn't great. direct my first movie until I was 50. Wow. Now think of it, Nora Ephron, responsible for Sleepless I mean, in Seattle, yep. You've Got Mail, Julia and Julia, you name it, right. had not directed her first movie until she was 50. And she was the one who believed in me and gave me that amazing role in Sleepless in Seattle. And then she cast me as, as the female lead opposite Steve Martin in a movie called Mixed Nuts mm -hmm. that nobody really <laughs> saw, but it's a cult favorite <laughs> during the holidays. Yeah. Anyway, um, but I really was so appreciative of that because mm -hmm. she was a woman who was a bit older than I was. Yeah. And she was the person who could say, here's how you do it. And she found yeah. her voice very early on as a journalist. And I think what we go through as women is we're all looking for those yeah. opportunities to 
use our voice. Right. You know, some yes. people get it when they're really young. Right. And some people, it, they grow into it. Right. And I feel like uh, I'm one of those people who kind of grew into it. Mm. Did you really? had a question about reinvention or we were talking well, about that. that. Right. Yes. That's what this whole podcast is yes. about, is really helping women say, okay, just because you turn 40 or you're 50 or 60 doesn't mean your life is over. You no. can reinvent. And, and I want to say this thing that I... I thought about this term reinvention a lot because mm -hmm. I, I'm like, what does that really mean? Yeah. And to me, reinvention meant like you are abandoning the old and you're taking on mm -hmm. something new and you're, you know, this is your new you. Yeah. And I've, I look at it in a slightly different way, mm -hmm. which is kind of like reintegration yes. or oh, re-energizing. That. That's good. Because you, it takes everything that you were before yeah. to get you to the place where you say, and now I'm going to do this. Yeah. Because without all of those experiences, how do you choose to say, I'm going to put myself out on the line and become a singer-songwriter? Right. I wanted to do that ever since I was a kid. Music mm. was my first love. I was desperate to do it, and I didn't know how. I would see people. I'd go to concerts. I worked at the amphitheater at Universal Studios and saw everybody come through there. And I would watch these women, Joni Mitchell, Carol King, mm -hmm. Carly Simon, um, Stevie Nicks, mm. you name it, they were there. And think, how do they do it? And I didn't play an instrument and I didn't um, know, like, how do you get a band? How do you yeah. write songs? How do you make that happen? I would have loved to have had a mentor at that mm -hmm. time to help me go, this is how you do it. Yeah. And then uh, when I was guess in my 50s, I met Cara Diaguardi. I had mm -hmm. done the musical Chicago on Broadway, which was another story which I'll tell you about. I love that. But, Wasn't she a judge on a... And she was a she judge was, on American she Idol. She was American yes, Idol. Yes, but yes, she's yes. also an incredible singer-songwriter yes, and a producer, yes. and she owns her own publishing company. And we were talking, because she had also done Chicago, and she said, uh, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, oh, my God, I'd give anything to be able to write a song. I don't know how to do that. She goes, what makes you think you don't know how to do that? And I said, mm -hmm. because I don't play an instrument. I don't read music. And she said, well, do you have something you want to say? Mm -hmm. And when she said that, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, I have yeah. a lot that I want to say. And she said, I'm going to write your first songs with you, which she did. So wow. she was another mentor for me. And, you know, I've often thought how improbable it is that I should be doing that now, because mm. I've had, I think I'm, I'm working on my fifth album now, but the, a, a friend of mine who's a very successful musician and singer-songwriter, I asked him once, what makes me think that I can start writing music now and singing when you've been doing it all your life? Mm -hmm. And he said, because creativity is time independent. Hmm. Now, that also blew my mind because it made me think, yes, there's no clock on when you can do whatever it is you want to do or be creative. Nobody's saying like, oh, sorry, yeah. you were supposed to yeah. get that by 26 and a half to 32 and a third. Exactly. Yeah, you missed yeah. that window. Sorry. Yeah. No. And I started becoming aware of all these incredible people who have done extraordinary things in their lives mm -hmm. after the age of 40 or 50 or yeah. whatever, and have reinvented or reintegrated or re-energized their lives. You but are that, the but, perfect person for our well, show. But I mean, you, this is what it's about, though. But, yeah. but you had a passion and, and in purpose. And I think, you know, when we're talking to other women, they say, we want to reinvent, we want to do something, but we don't know what to do. I think it's important that they look inside, find that inner voice inside of them and say, what is it that you're passionate about? I mean, you've been passionate about songwriting you know, forever, but what made you believe that you could do it? What got you out of the comfort zone or maybe the uncomfortable zone of saying, I can't do this? How do you go from the I can't to mm -hmm. I will and I can't and I'm going That's to? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a period of time where you sit with it. Mm. You ask yourself, and you don't have the answer. And you have to really quiz yourself, and you have to go deep. I think as women, um, and if you're a parent or a, a mother, you put out for so much of your life, 
And when the kids grow up and they are, you're an empty nester maybe, or you start seeing that they're going to be leaving the house, you start asking yourself, what is it that I love? What is it that I want? What is it that I'm passionate about? What satisfies me? And um, it takes a while to come up with that answer. And for me, um, it was inspired by an article that I had read. It was an interview with Oprah. And the interviewer had asked her, how do you do all these things that you do? You have your show and you have um, books and you uh, tour and you produce movies and, you know, she does everything. She does everything, right. And she said, well, I know what it is that I want. Mm. And when you know what it is that you want, you can take steps to make that happen. Mm. And I thought to myself, that's amazing. Yeah. And then I thought, what is it that I want? And I couldn't even ask myself that question because I thought I was going to be struck by lightning or something. Did I you think it was selfish to I ask that? I felt it was very selfish to ask that question wow. and I felt like how could I possibly ask anything? I'm blessed with an amazing family and husband and parents and good health and how could I even go there? And I couldn't. I couldn't wow. even answer it. Every time I tried to ask myself that question, I'd shut it down. Wow. So I did that classic actor's game which is uh, what if? And I was like, what if, what if I could ask myself what I wanted? What yeah. if I wanted something? What would that be? Yeah. So I played that game and it took me about two to three months. Wow. And when the answer happened, it was music. Mm. And it was as clear as day. It's like a windshield that gets wiped clean. And you're yeah. like, oh, that's it. And I have mm. found in my journeys of doing music that I meet people, sign CDs, and uh, they always say something like this to me, which is, wow, I've always wanted to mm. fill in the blank. Yeah. And this is men and women. Mm -hmm. And mm. what I learned by talking to them is that everybody has a dream and they kind of know what it is that they love and they're passionate about at a pretty young age. It's how you, how that message is responded to by the people that you admire in your life, which indicates how you go forward. Mm -hmm. Now, so many people have said that their parents said, I'm not paying yeah. for you to go to college and be an actor. Right. You can't make a living at that. Right. Or I'm not going to, that is a terrible profession. You, uh, you know, you can't ever be a success in that, or those are bad people, or whatever it is, it's usually the passion that they have is for something creative or sure. something that feels like it's not a real job. Right. And yet... You can't make any money. You can't make no any money at it. Yes. Right. And yet, look at all the amazing things that we have because of because somebody's creative creative. idea whether it's a song or a movie or a book or a piece of journalism or a painting yeah. or anything. It had to start somewhere. It had to start yeah. somewhere. And even science is creative. Even math is creative. But if you love doing that thing, pursue it and things will work out. You don't know where it's going to lead. Right. But if you don't do it, you You're will gonna... always long for it and you will yeah. ache for it and you will always ache think, what if? Right. Rita, Maybe. do you believe that there's a calling on your life? Like we're all, we all come in with a purpose or with a dream or with a calling that, that is divinely inspired? I, I do. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm Greek Orthodox. It's, uh, yeah. you know, I'm very proud of my faith. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, God is a present, presence in my life. Mm -hmm. And I try hard to listen to that. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's sometimes it's very very hard to have faith mm -hmm. that things are going to be okay and it's not i'm not just talking about work or the things that you love and the passions mm -hmm. that you have but just things about your health or mm -hmm. things about your family sure. or things about your friends and um i i rely on that it's mm -hmm. it's the hardest thing to do sometimes sure because yeah. we think if we're competent people that we can make everything happen and we can make it better and yeah. we're all on top of it and then something you know takes you out at the knees and you're like uh oh yeah what do i do now so what <laughs> do you do when that happens when challenges arise and 
or happened as we know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know. You've got to go deeper. Yeah. You've got to go deeper and you've got to go deeper into trust and you have to go deeper into faith. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to uh, understand that there might be a better reason. I, I love that, that mm. idea that there are dots that are being connected and you may not see what the picture yes. is and you don't know where the map is going, yeah, right. but you have to have faith that there is a bigger picture somewhere that's being drawn yeah. with these dots Absolutely. that are being connected. Right. There's a phrase at USM, University of Santa Monica, where Di and I you know, went to study for two years. And in the prayer life, um, we learned this phrase, you can ask you know, God for direction, you ask for what you desire and hope that you know, this works out. But the phrase is, and may this all happen in the highest good of all. Yes. All right? Because it's yes. not just about us. Yes. Exactly. It's yes. like if we right. wanted this one thing, and maybe it wouldn't be so great for our, yeah. our partners or our children. It's always the highest good that's, of all concerns. That's highest, right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it, that gave me comfort. It, it absolutely mm -hmm. does because I, you know, you could say if it's God's will. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. right. And, uh, I, I just, that's, that's what gives you the trust. That's what yeah. gives you the mm -hmm. confidence to move forward. That's what gives you faith. Yeah. I mean, I am speaking only for myself. That's right. what works for me. Sure. <laughs> you know? sure. Everybody has different ways to approach things. Yeah. But. And it can be in a higher, in a higher power. I just have to say this one little thing. Cause I was telling Di, it's so funny. Cause I, you and I have a similar devotional book called Jesus Saves. Jesus Calling. Jesus Calling. Oh my gosh. Every I, day. It's on my phone. It's on my phone too. And yes. I, I was telling Dias and I saw this interview and I was like, oh my God. I said, this is the same devotional that I've been doing since I was like 18 years old. Yes. Of course, I can't find it right now, but it was today's devotion was about trusting that all will work out. And if you have that trust and belief in a higher power, whatever it is that you, yeah. you know, believe yeah. in and you give it all over, surrender. then good things will happen in the surrender. Yeah. The surrender yeah, of it all. Right. Yes. And to trust that we don't have control over anything. No. We just have control of what our reaction is going to exactly. be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's it. But yeah. you were diagnosed with cancer. You had breast cancer a few right. years back. And how did that shift your life and change your perspective on everything? It, it was crazy. Uh, well, I, first of all, deeper gratitude. Mm -hmm. Anytime you confront a health crisis or anything that's going on with anybody in your family yeah. or, or whatever, and it's really out of your control, that is a real wake up call. Yeah. And yet I'm, you find gratitude in even the cancer. You're like, wow, mm -hmm. I'm so thankful they caught it early. Yeah. I'm so <sighs> thankful for my friends who said, one girlfriend, Mary Flaherty said, you gotta get a second opinion in your pathology because I had initially been misdiagnosed and told that I did not have breast cancer. Oh, wow. Oh, and wow. I had a gut instinct that it just didn't feel right mm -hmm. because the answers I was getting from my first doctor were like, oh, yeah, um, you know, I had an underlying condition called uh, pleomorphic globular carcinoma in C2, for anybody <laughs> out there who wants to look it up. Right. And there, it's vague, and hmm. they don't know, but they know that some uh, that when that condition is present, you it's usually associated with breast cancer. Hmm. So my tissue initially came back non-cancerous. Hmm. And my girlfriend Mary said, go get your second opinion on your pathology. And I did, and it came back cancer. Wow. Then I had a third <laughs> test on it, because I'm like, now I have one saying yes, one saying no, right. and it was cancer. Hmm. Um, I had bilateral mastectomy and reconstruction. Thank you find gratitude in your doctors. You find gratitude mm. in the outpouring of love that comes from Mm. complete strangers and a community of women mm -hmm. and men who also have breast cancer that uh, help you. They yeah. strengthen you. They buoy you. They say, I've been through it. I'm a survivor 22 years. I'm a survivor 35 years. I'm a survivor. And you realize that there, there's good out of it. The other thing is you look at time differently. Yeah. You really, really do look at your future as something that's finite. I mean, mm. I guess when you're young, you, you can right. say everything is finite. You could walk right. across the street tomorrow and you know, sure. get run over by a bus. But- Or well, you're invincible. Where, yes, but you right. don't think that because you're in your 20s. Right. 
And so when you uh, confront something like that where you don't know what your prognosis mm -hmm. is going to be initially, you um, definitely have uh, an awareness of mortality. Mm -hmm. And so you think, all right, what do I want to tell my family? What do I want to tell my children? How do I want to live my life going forward? Mm -hmm. How am I going to spend my time and with whom yeah. and uh, where? Because mm. you, I, I have felt that I say no to a lot more things mm -hmm. and a lot more people and um, not in a bad way. It's just the energy that you want to conserve for the things that are very important to you, whether yeah. it's your family mm -hmm. or your work or a number of those things. Yeah. Sure. I believe time is our most valued commodity. Absolutely. Yes. I've always thought that. Yes. And Absolutely. so I think that when you um, you honor your time, you mm -hmm. fill it with things that are... You, you really know. do. Yeah. Well, there, it's yeah. self-love. And you know, it's so funny because when you talk about, mm -hmm. say that word to women, you get a reaction like, <gasps> No, I don't really love myself. I'm not supposed to love myself. I'm supposed to be the caretaker and put everybody else first. But self-love is something that's so important in all of us and having boundaries and, and being able to say no and to be able to, sometimes you have to release some friends. Yeah. Sometimes you have to release some things, projects. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you say self-love looks like to you? Hmm. It's so interesting because I uh, we talked a little bit earlier about that feeling like initially feeling like it's selfish mm -hmm. and I think women are um, at least of a certain generation might feel that anything that uh, is self-love can feel selfish yeah. um, I could probably do better at uh, that but self-love to me looks like doing the things that are important you mm -hmm. know writing music mm -hmm. saying what i have to say i feel like i'm uh, on a mission to just keep writing mm -hmm. and i don't know why but i'm just going with that flow i think it's important as we get older uh, we've always been part of a, a community that gives back but you start thinking about how do you want to really put yourself in a, mm -hmm. a place that is helping others? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, I'm a, a big believer in laughter, love, and friends. Like, you have to make time for your friends. Yes. You have to yes. schedule your friends <laughs> just like so you true. schedule so your doctor support. Yes. It's true. It's true. Because nobody's going to pick up the phone and no. go, hey, today you have a free day. I Call your friends. <laughs> See if they're free. No. I know. Yeah. You have to so show true. your friends that you love them yeah. and mm. spend time with them and your children and your husband and whoever else is in your life yeah. that you love. Yeah. Make time for them mm. because I always I, I tell friends like <laughs> and I'm sure they think I'm a little weirdo but like <laughs> I tell my friends that are like dudes and things like I love you dude yeah you know that. and they're like what I know like I'm like yeah I do and it's a I little know too much. I, yeah they're like that's too much I'm like sorry I love you and give Aww. me a hug you know yeah. because I I feel like if tomorrow is the last day yeah mm. I, I don't you need to. I know. Oh, you said I that. Know. I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's because you got teary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so because true. Because it's profound. It's profound. It's, yes. Okay. It's, it's everything. It's life. I mean, that's what it's about. I believe we're here to love. Yes. And that true. is it. And I think love heals. And it's and so true. all the other stuff is stuff, right? Yes. And at the end of the day, how you oh. connect with another, <laughs> how know. you make a difference in the world, yes. how you, you It's know. important and as women doing this together as, you know, girl tribe and stuff. Mm -hmm. And w when you brought up um, that about, you know, friends and, and celebrating your life, I remember when you came to Sun Valley, you did a concert and Di oh, was there with me so too. Good. And you so sang a song mm. talking about your voice and how songwriting, you know, yeah. the voice, because I think it's so important, the message to pass on to younger women too, yes. to let them know the younger ones, like we were saying, the 20 year olds, to know what's coming. Yeah. You know, so your songs. And that you're not sitting in a rocking chair. Well, no, and, no, and your songs. not that that's bad. But, but your songs. That could be your passion. Right. <laughs> I will say when I saw you on stage, 
I said this to Perry. I go, she is so lit up. Yes. You are so lit up. Like, because I'm like, I want to be able to sing. I mean, you know, it was so just true. so, you were so lit up. And there was something about that. I was like, yeah. that's it. Well, that's let me, let me tell you the song that yeah. really got me that, that, um, and I didn't know the backstory then, and you told us later on. But, you know, the song, Throw Me a Party. Mm. And I'd love for you to share what that song was about and why it was written, because it's such a powerful message and celebrating in self-love. So. Um, well, uh, I had started writing music, and uh, after I had been diagnosed and before I had my surgery, um, I said to my husband, I'm like, look, there's some things we have to talk about here. And if something happens and I should go before you, mm. I want you to do a couple of things. And one of them was, um, I think you should be sad for a very, very long time. <laughs> of course. I love that. Yes. Um, like super long. <laughs> like a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be watching <laughs> like, you, by the way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, the other thing was, I want you to throw me a party. Mm. And so, because I wanted life to be a celebration. Yeah. And so I had that title, Throw Me a Party, and I wrote it with two amazing Nashville writers, uh, mm -hmm. Christian Bush and Liz Rose. And it really was about that moment, about let's have it be a celebration, mm -hmm. let's have it be uh, telling stories and um, a lot of music and I had in my head everything that it was going to be and who would sing and uh, you know who would speak and yeah. um, I, I just feel like yes you know we all have to have a moment of grieving and sure. even the friends that I've lost and my parents mm -hmm. and um, I still think of them every single day and a friend of, of mine mm -hmm. um, the director Mike Nichols said this to me after my dad died he goes remember the conversation continues. Mm. And I still talk to all Absolutely. those people that I love yeah. in my head every day. How you doing? Leave me alone. Go <laughs> away. Come back. Um, Help. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I wanted it to feel, I, I wanted to have a song that could communicate exactly what that was. Mm. And that goes along with what Kara says, you know, uh, Kara Diaguardi, mm -hmm. do you have something you want to say? Yeah. And for me, um, my voice is being used literally and metaphorically through songwriting and singing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is around for everybody. Okay, there's another song that was one of my favorites. I know, I'm, I'm such a Rita fan with your songwriting. Thank it's you. So it's, I just love the lyrics, and you spend so much time and effort in the yeah. lyrics. Um, the Spark. Yeah. Because long-term relationships, whether with, with girlfriends, with lovers, with husbands, the words that you share in the lyrics are so important. So would you share some of those sure. with us? Because I love um, that. I wrote that song with Annie Bosco and John Shanks, uh, two amazing writers. And uh, for me, it was about anybody who's in a long-term relationship. And uh, we all know that there are ups and downs and good days and bad days. Sure. But... Uh, it's important to keep those embers going mm. because as long as you have an ember going, you can create a fire. Yeah. So to me, the spark is ab about that yeah. that very thing, like just keep it going. Mm. And you know, one of the things that I feel very blessed with is that when uh, Tom and I were dating, we were standing on a corner in New York City and he was holding my hand and he said, he looked at me and he said, I just want to tell you that you never have to change anything about who you are or mm. what you do in order to be with me. Oh, what a that thing no guy say. had ever said that to me. And wow. it was literally mm. like a wave of warmth wow. flooded my body. And I could not believe that I was hearing that. Wow. And I was like, okay, that guy. Yeah. 
You get you a second you. day. Yeah. He's a keeper. <laughs> He's a keeper. You're like, yes. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Oh, to I, be accepted. Yeah. Yes. You know, and that's that's what we all want. We yeah. all want to be heard. Well, they say the no, number one thing in relationships is really to meet the other person where they are and not cha try and change them. Yeah. And when you can really love them right as they are, right now, right where they are, yeah. and not fantasize about when they're like this, yes. when they do this, if right. they do this. Right. Instead of just loving them right where they are. Yes. No matter what. I think and that's so beautiful. You know, that's a um, that's an important distinction because it, when you're in a long term relationship, like we're thirty two years married yeah. now, wow. you Incredible. get to a you're you're changing along the way mm -hmm. and you constantly have to be meeting somebody where they are. Yeah. That's that's what makes it a long-term relationship. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. some people, I don't know. I mean, some people do egregious things, and you're like, I'm not meeting where you are. As a matter of fact, I'm kicking you over there. By the way, you're <laughs> exactly. <'Cause> like, <laughs> you go find somebody else to meet you. But, yeah. <laughs> I love that about you. I love but, it. Yes. Um, but I, I do think, <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's the, yeah. the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were talking a little bit earlier just about in America and women that are older and it's not as valued as in some other cultures. Right. Mm -hmm. And we really want to want to change that conversation. I mean that is yeah. the purpose of doing what we're doing. Yes. And really my belief is that well is that women are the wisdom keepers. And as we get older um, there's so much value mm -hmm. to give back. There's so much we have to contribute. Yes. And I really want women to embrace every part of, of aging. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Of this life. Is, it makes me crazy <laughs> on certain levels mm -hmm. because if you look at the demographic <clears throat> that has the um, highest disposable income, it's yeah. women. Mm -hmm over the age of 40 and 50. Mm -hmm. And we make all the choices about vacations and which yeah. cars to buy and which refrigerators and mm -hmm. yet no one really markets to us or values us in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. America is still a very uh, youth-based culture. If you go to Greece mm -hmm. or Bulgaria, you see multi-generations mm -hmm. hanging out together. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, uh, oh, that's the kids' table over there. Everybody yeah. is at the same table. Yeah. Everybody is celebrating life together. And they uh, it's just the way people live mm -hmm. over there. Um, There's no distinction. No distinction. Mm -hmm. and, and moms are helping kids and uh, grandkids. And, you know, that is a, a really beautiful thing. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that does exist in America, but it's not... Um, Valued. It's not in the media. It's, it's not, not in it's the not media. In the media. No, and right. it's not. It's not talked about in a way that is really great. It's yeah. think about it. You know, to to be able to still be really vibrant and and at a point in your life where you've lived your life and you have so much to give to mm -hmm. young women or your grandchildren or yes. uh, yeah. you yes. know people in the community I, I mean you go to any any old age home or any place where you see elderly people and they are amazing oh, and yeah. they are telling the truth yeah because Always. they are n they don't <laughs> yeah. care There's about no BS. <laughs> no no yep. they don't care no. about mm -hmm. like oh i've got to have an image here or whatever yeah. it's all truth all true. and yeah. you've got it like uh, what a relief i mean so i i know from okay i have a little confession to make i'm coming out of the closet tell okay us, tell us. so we were talking about how when we get older <laughs> we start really being truth tellers I had an issue telling people my real age. Mm. I didn't come out with the truth until what? Less than a year ago? A year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. Because mm -hmm. people had asked me how old I was, and I have, I'm ashamed to say I would lie. It was because I was dating. Wow. I thought if I said my real age that mm -hmm. men would think, oh my God, she's too old, I don't want to date her, blah, blah, blah. And then I was on a dating app, which is, oh my God, so horrific. Oh God. <laughs> I know. And I would always make myself, you know, as much as I could get away with four or five years younger. Right. But 
it was so free. And this one would tell me, why, why, did you, why are you so you know, ashamed of that? You look great. You've taken care of yourself. Blah, blah, blah. Completely. I know. And so I finally said it. And I almost choked on my own words. <laughs> I have to say, so anybody, any women out there who are going through this, listen, it can be so liberating. But I am 62 years old. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I But really it took a while to get it out because of judgment and... Self-judgment. Self-judgment. Self -judgment. Yeah. And I had to forgive myself for judging myself that I was an old, unlovable woman because I was 62 years old. I know it sounds crazy, but mm -hmm. I know Because you bought people. into what society tells us. Right. I did. And exactly. what it tells us is that at a and certain age. And it's not age, so much society as it is media. Media. It is I would media. agree. Because when yeah. we sit down yeah. and have conversations with them, they're like, yeah. we feel great. We just want right. to be valued exactly. as that. We want to embrace right. that. And yes. so I want. I think everyone should just come out of the closet and just be super stoked <laughs> about it. Right? I love it. Take over the world. Yeah, girl. Yeah, just owning but I mean, it. just owning it. Oprah just even says that. Just owning it. 63. Oh, yes. I love yes. it. Yes. 57. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> We're all freedom fighters. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> no, but it's important. It's just, it's important. It and is. I don't even care what your choices are as you get older. Right. Just own it. Like yes. own right. yourself. Do whatever you want to do. So you true. know, but just own who you are. And support I think it's really support other women. And support yeah. other yeah. women. I mean, we've been having so much fun doing this show together. Yeah. I mean, because for years I worked on my own in my career. Right. She's worked on your own. You've worked on your own. But when you get to a certain age, you want that tribe of women again. That yes. village. Yes. Because when we I mean let's face it, when we are feeling kind of bad, we're like Okay, Di, I feel really crappy right now. <laughs> Am yeah. I really? So, are you kidding? And she like pumps me yes. up, you know, vice versa. Yes. Or yes. projects together. Like you were so gracious to be on their show, and you were like, "Are you kidding? I want to support you guys." Absolutely. And, it's, and an we don't realize how that keeps us young and connected and loving. Yes. And being in our loving instead of our competition or right. whatever it is for right. us. And I really feel like it. The, the important thing, like what you said, is just to feel alive, feel excited yeah. about something, whatever it is you're creating in your life. Yes. If you're excited to do to go to the park and hang out with whoever, that's yeah. great too. Yeah. Just find what really lights you up in life mm -hmm. and don't yeah. ever like settle for not having yeah, that. That's right. Because I think at every stage of your life, it can look different. And like yeah. what you've done, it totally is it's looking different. You know, you're yeah. a singer, songwriter. It's like what lights you up? And that is what I want every woman to not think they're so they're they're past that point. We've missed it. Yeah. Like I believe. Well, a lot of times too, I think um, <clears throat> people perceive doing the things that you love with some um, form of. Uh, let me let me say it this way: It doesn't matter where you're at in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life, what you do in your mm -hmm. life, how much money you have, mm -hmm. um, if you're married or single or divorced or whatever. You can find the thing that you want to do and do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when, when I would meet with people after my show and they'd say, I've always wanted to be an actor or I, I wanted to do stand-up comedy, I would say to them, okay, I'm going to tell you, go back to your hometown, wherever it was, and look up what is your communi community college offering, mm -hmm. what is your church offering, what is, uh, you know, is there a comedy club that is teaching classes, Yeah. is there an art class? Mm -hmm. Years ago, I was, you know, getting ready to go on vacation with my family, and I Everybody was taken care of. Everybody had their hobbies and their classes and their organizing and whatever. And we got to vacation and I was like, uh, oh, I forgot to plan something for myself. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's it. When I get back, I'm going to take a painting class. So, good. so I went to the local art studio and I signed up for a class and I literally knew nothing. I knew zero. I had nothing, no technique. Right. And I started, it was the class was from September to June, once a week. And I did that class for five years. Wow. And wow. now I can, you know, at least enjoy myself. At, at least yeah. it kind of looks like something that you think it's going to look like when you start <laughs> out. But the point, the, what I learned from that was that if you do something consistently enough, 
mm -hmm. you're not going to get worse at it. Yeah. Right. Think about it. Even if it was just doing sit-ups every day or, you're right, get abs. or playing tennis <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. If you do it every day and you just do little by little, yeah. you're going to get better at it. You're going to get right. stronger. Yep. And, and that is the, the lesson there because I think that we have to encounter fear and failure and go, oh my God, and that is the worst draw. I can't draw. Mm. I, that sucks. I'm giving up. But I think understanding that that's everybody's process, that everybody's going, going to encounter failure, mm -hmm. that it's okay. it's okay. And you get over that hump, but you yeah. have to go through it. There's yeah. no easy way. You, gotta go you can't it. like dig a, a tunnel no. and like go through <laughs> go a tunnel. Through, bypass it. No, no detours. You right. gotta hike the hill and get yeah. to the no other side. No spiritual bypass. You gotta go through yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I know we gotta wrap it up here, okay. but, but one final question that I wanted to ask you, and and that is the theme of the show, Own mm -hmm. Your Throne. So in spending time with us and talking, and I know it's the same messaging that you feel is important for women to know, what to you is the meaning of owning your throne? Mm. I love that big smile on your right face. <laughs> okay, let me think about that. <laughs> Thrones typically are... Um, associated with queens mm -hmm. or kings mm -hmm. and there's been some sort of an asc asc ascension to get there oh. or it's been passed down hmm. to you and for me owning a throne is not that it's been given to you or that um, you've born into it mm -hmm. but that you're creating it and that you are allowing yourself to build a life and a creative life that is specific to you mm -hmm. and to your own life. And so I guess it means that mm -hmm. um, it's nothing that's given to you. It's something that you have to create. Mm -hmm. mm, beautiful. I want to just put a tiara on your I head. I know, right we now. should have a crown to stick on our head. I like a little tiara. <laughs> like oh, I think, it. I, 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 I think you should do that. I think you should have yes. like a, a little, little fake tiara that yeah. you should at give the end, like, at after you ask that question. Right? Say, so you've yes. earned yours. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wave. Yeah. Well, Rita, thank oh. you so much I for know. giving this was such a great conversation. We love you so much, and we so We're appreciate so the great work you're doing out in the yeah, world. Thank you. Keep writing those songs because the messages are so powerful. Thank you. And you make us both cry yeah. when we listen to the. You should have well, made me cry. Oh yeah, yeah, we're all a bunch of. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you're but just, it's good. just the inspiration. Just yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We love you. Oh, thank you, Rose. Yes. That's right, yes. baby. Yes. Right. Hey, look, I, look at my feet. I'm trying to disown my sofa right here. <laughs>